So um, I invited Capriel to join us again. We had so much fun this summer talking about strawberries and making a delicious cake that I decided to invite her back um, to talk about the holiday, what we could serve that's special for the holidays. And Capriel has got such a huge laundry list of amazing things that she's done. She was the first female winner of the James Beard Award. She's written many cookbooks, had a TV show, and now is co-owner of Madison Kitchen in Madison Park. Welcome Capriel. We're so thrilled to have you here tonight. It's Thanks. so nice to see you. Thanks. Thanks. It's nice to be here and hello to all my friends and family and new friends out there. Thanks for joining us. Um, already we have big fans for of Capriel from Portland. <laughs> so you have a lot of big fans. And I was, I, as I was telling you earlier, a friend of mine, um, they um, are on this afternoon, Richard and um, Wendy. And Richard um, emailed me earlier today and said that he named his daughter after you about 25 years ago. So <laughs> you're so famous. That makes me feel so, so many old. Years. <laughs> <laughs> but Capriel, I've been wondering um, myself and just curious, you know, thinking about you and this evening and just. Um, your history, but I was wondering if you could tell us, you know, that the moment in your life that you're like, this is what I want to do. What was that moment? I'll uh, try to make it short, but I went to St. Mary's Academy in Portland, Oregon, which is an all girls Catholic high school, private high school. Uh, so it was very uh, college bound. 99% of the girls there go on to secondary education. Uh, so there was a lot of push to go to college, and um, I thought I was going to be a doctor. So I was very interested in science, loved biology. So I had a great high school uh, counselor, which I know people don't believe, but I had a great counselor, and she said, get a job in a hospital. Go volunteer in, in a hospital. And I couldn't have hated every single thing about working <laughs> in that hospital more I, I was just I just hated it and I was a little devastated because I sort of am somebody who gets a goal in my mind and then I work towards it and um so I was like well, what else do I like to do there's I don't have anything else that I'm really interested in and cooking was one of the things that I did as a hobby as a kid and I loved Julia Child I was a huge fan of hers as a kid as a little kid Mm -hmm. And so I got a job in this deli that's still there in Portland um, called the Autos. And I don't know why they hired me. I had no cooking experience, but they let me work in the kitchen. And literally the day I walked in that kitchen, I was like, this is where I'm supposed to be. That was at 17. <laughs> I love I love that story. You just never know what's going to one thing leads to another. And who knew from doctor to doctor to chef? Well, yes. you know, world renowned chef. So that's fabulous. Yeah. And for some people, it comes later. Just for everybody, it's different, right? Yeah, it's different for everyone. So tell us about the Madison Kitchen and what's going on there these days during this crazy pandemic. Yes. Um, Madison Kitchen is a teeny tiny little restaurant in Madison Park. And and um, we used to do part to go and part in house to sit down restaurant. Um, now we're 100 percent to go. We have a little outside seating. Um, what we did is we took the seating out because it's so small you can't stand in line, be six feet apart, and have somebody sit on in a table. So we put tables down the center and filled it with retail food that we create. And then along the back wall, we have retail where the bench seating is and my dad who's an artist made some things for us so we have some really cool different things I have some sugar cane bags that are these really cool market bags that are made out of sugar cane really cool colors and it was really fun. actually kind of fun to do um, <laughs> I get to go shop basically well so that I has really helped augment not being able to have people sit inside and we have a very very good strong community and they have been very appreciative and very good at supporting us well that's so nice it's so important these days to have a strong community and to buy local as much as possible Absolutely. and that's something that we were talking about earlier that you know really is our job right now to keep local businesses 
in business and shop there and do as much as we can um, locally. I do have a question, uh, Capriel, for those people who are joining us from around the country. Um, do you mail anything out from your restaurant? Do you do you have no, a- No, not really. Not Most of our point. things are too fragile or they're too perishable and I'm not, mm -hmm. um, I don't want you to have something that's a couple or days old to a week old. I'd rather have you have it right when it's the best. Um, I just thought I would ask just in case because we yeah. do have, you know, yeah. so many people. No, they just have to wait till this pandemic is over and come visit us. We're yes. literally a block from the beach. So that sounds fabulous. A beautiful neighborhood. So tonight we're here to talk about making souffle easy. So take it away. I can't okay. wait to see and I can't wait to make it. We'll be emailing out the recipe um, later tonight. Right. So we're going to make a souffle and we're also going to make a delicious caramel sauce. Um, so souffle is all about mystery and everybody thinks it's so hard to do. And this is actually a recipe that I adapted from uh, Savier magazine. And the reason why I love it is that it's so, so simple. Um, oftentimes with, with a souffle, you have to make a pastry cream, which isn't hard, but it's a, a bigger step than the way we're gonna make this base. So you always have a base and then you're gonna fold in the egg whites. And I really think maybe the egg whites are where people get a little bit held up. So we'll talk a lot about the egg whites when we get to that step. But the first thing we're gonna do is we're gonna, I'm gonna grab the milk off of the stove and we're gonna add the chocolate into the milk, all right? So I have some warm milk in this pan and I'm gonna just, Go down here. So this is a little bit of milk and sugar in the pan. And then I kind of softened my chocolate up just to make it a little easier. So this is semi-sweet uh, chocolate and it's a baking chocolate. So you want a baking chocolate, not a chocolate chip because chocolate chips, and I always have a hard time saying this, but chocolate chips have lecithin in them. And lecithin is what keeps them chip shaped so that when you make your cookies, you bite into that little chip and it doesn't melt completely into the cookie. Well, we want this to melt completely. So that's why you want a good baking chocolate. All right, so I'm just stirring the milk and the chocolate together. So normally you would have to make a pastry cream, which would involve um, half and half and eggs and uh, some type of roux, whether that is flour or uh, cornstarch. With this, we literally just have the chocolate going into a bowl with the milk and a little bit of the sugar, all right? And you wanna make sure you get every bit of that chocolate. And this chocolate isn't super warm, so we can add the egg yolks into it, but if it goes right from the stove into the bowl, you wanna make sure that you give it a little bit of time to cool down so that the egg yolks don't cook in here. So I'm just gonna put this to the side. All right, so we have our bowl with our chocolate in it. Pretty simple so far, a little bit of sugar. Now, I have some egg whites and some egg yolks. So I'm gonna do five whites and three yolks. So I'm just separating the eggs. Now normally what I would do if we, I'm gonna do, go down just a little bit. If we weren't on camera and I could go wash my hands quickly, I would just do this between my fingers, but it's too difficult with this setup to be able to do that. So you just wanna crack your egg and then we're just gonna go back and forth. Try to keep the oh, white- Can you move the camera down just a little bit more? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank Is that you. better? A little bit more. There you go. Thank you. So try to keep the whites clean. So we don't want any of the yolk in there. So you wanna be kind of gentle at this point to make sure you keep your whites nice and clean. All right, I'm putting the yolks in those bowls. I just freeze the yolks to use later. 
And it's best if your eggs are a little bit warm, all right? I'm just gonna set this aside and then we're gonna stir those yolks into the chocolate mixture. All right, so there's our base. It's as simple as that. Chocolate, milk, egg yolks, a little bit of sugar, and then I have a little sugar that's gonna go in with the whites. I have a little chunk here I need to break up. All right. All right, let's set that aside. Now the whites. So with the whites, this is where I think people have a, the most trouble with this. They probably are gonna add the sugar too quickly. They don't get the whites foamy enough before they start to add the sugar and their whites are probably a little bit too cold. So I let this sit out about an hour before we made it. If you feel uncomfortable with that because it's eggs, you can always just run some warm water over the eggs before you crack them, just to kind of warm them up a little bit. You just get more volume. You're gonna get better whites if you do that. So I have a nice balloon whip here. So nice balloon shape. I have a little bit of sugar. It's a little less than a third of a cup. We put the rest of that third of a cup in with the chocolate and the milk, and now I'm gonna whip. So you can do this with a machine, but I like to do it by hand when I demonstrate. So it's gonna be a little noisy, sorry. But we're gonna whip this until it starts to get nice and foamy. You know, you would think if you do this enough as a chef, you wouldn't have that thing that hangs under your arm that waves when you wave, but you still do. Whipping. And you can see the whites are starting to get nice and foamy. At this point, you can add just a little bit of your sugar and then keep whipping. So if you're doing this on the machine, you just add your sugar as the whites are going on the machine. Okay, we're gonna add a little more. Just wanna make sure you add the sugar nice and slow. You have to switch arms. One more sugar. You can see these are starting to get nice and creamy and almost starting to hold a shape. A little bit more sugar. All right, last little bit of sugar. Okay, you wanna whip the white until they hold a piece, but just a nice soft piece. You don't want them to be too dry because if they're too dry, it's difficult to get them folded into the batter properly. So we're just gonna give this one more little whip. I'm glad I've been doing all that yoga during this pandemic. That helped that go faster. All right, so I'll bring in my bowl. So here's our chocolate in here. Here's our whites. So the best thing to do is to add about half your whites. All right. And you're going to want to gently fold those in. And part of it is that the chocolate will get a little bit set up. So you have to whip this a little more than you would when we put the remaining part in. So go from the bottom all the way around. Get that a tiny bit cold. So we're just gonna give it a little quick whip. At home, if that gets a little bit cold like that, you can just put it over a little simmering water for a second and then soften it down. And we're gonna add the rest of our whites. and gently, gently fold these. 
So at this point, we want to use really big movements and fold nice and gentle. A little bit of striation of the white is fine. That means you mixed it properly, but you don't want too much. So just make sure chocolate's heavy, go all the way to the bottom. All right, there's our little batter, super simple. You can take your batter and put it in the cups and put it in the refrigerator and let it sit in there for two hours before you cook them up. So you can have this all ready before your guests even arrive or your one son like our, like our Christmas is gonna be. <laughs> All right, so I'm going to pull this up a little bit. So can we also, somebody ask, um, is there a brand of chocolate that you like? I really like Coutard and it's easy to find. So they now have a brand, they have a, a baking packet, I guess you would say, mm -hmm. at the store that you can find pretty easily. So is that QFC or Whole Foods? Yeah, they should have it. Okay. Just about anybody should have that brand. Yeah. Okay, great. And then... What I like to do, so I have, you know, I'm a chef, so of course I have ramekins at home, but you could use a coffee cup that's oven proof. You could basically use anything that's oven proof. And then I just uh, lightly buttered it and sugared it. So I have this all done. And then I have this, I'm gonna just put the camera down so you can see. I have it in a container so that I can easily get it to and from the oven or from the refrigerator to the oven, right? Some people say that you can freeze souffles, but I've never tried that. So you could give it a shot if you had some extra and see how it worked out. Or let's say only two of you are gonna be there for Christmas, freeze the other two and save them for New Year's Eve and see how it works out. Because even if it doesn't work perfectly, it's still gonna be like a delicious pudding, warm, kind of gooey, ooey, and you're gonna have the caramel sauce to use. So there's kind of no way to lose. All right, so we're just gonna gently put this in our cups. My kitty is talking to me from the counter that he should not be on. All right, I'm just dividing this into the cups. And I go right to the top. I'm gonna use my convection setting on this. And sometimes if you go a little too high with that, I've, I've actually had it blow the top of the souffle off, uh, which I promptly just threw back on the souffle and then ran to the table and put lots of sauce on it. But it looks better when it's not <laughs> blown off. All right, so we're in our cups. So let's say uh, you wanna add something fun to this. You know, if you've got kids, you could do something like a little sprinkle on top. So we could do one that sprinkles for the kids. I have some candy cane. I'm just gonna push this to the side for a second. I have some really good quality candy cane that I'm gonna just throw in a baggie. So you can see that. Smash and throw those on top of the other three for the adults. So you could do this with kind of any kind of pretty Christmas candy that you like. All right, now we're going into the oven. Okay, I know that many, many of you out there have a convection oven. This is the time to turn your convection oven on. Everybody tells me that they're afraid of it, but now is the time to do it because that really benefits the souffle. So I'm gonna take this over and put it in the oven then I'm gonna bring you with me in just a sec. So doesn't it look delicious? And we'll get to some of these questions in just a moment it's as well. So um, somebody was asking, how much cacao do you recommend? Like the percentage from that brand that you are? I like, um, usually I get 60 and above is my preference. Let's see. Now we got to make sure you can see my caramel sauce. All right. And what is the temperature for the convection oven? 
The temperature is 375, but I'm going to tell you a little trick that I do with home ovens. I preheat my oven. Sorry, I'm coming back. I preheat my oven to 400, pop the convection on, and then when I put the souffles in, I set it down to 375. So what that does by kind of preheating it a little bit more, it uh, allows the temperature to stay a little more stable for the souffles when it goes in. And then I didn't pop the convection on until right when I threw them in. So Capril, what if you don't have a convection oven? If you don't have a convection oven, I would go up to 400 or 425, use a little more heat. And make okay, sure and then do you use the middle shelf or? Yeah, that's what I was gonna say. It's like, make sure okay. you have room for them to rise. So they're gonna rise up. So don't put them right, right against the <laughs> Right shelf. against, it's like, yeah. <laughs> then you'll get I the wrong that. design on top. Like, did I do that? <laughs> no, I didn't. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Sometimes you never know. Um, yeah. So, and and actually, this is going to be hard for a lot of home cooks. You kind of just got to let it do its thing. So, give it at least fifteen minutes, um, and then take a peek at it. So, because you just don't want the air the air to come in, and also you don't want the temperature to go up and down, up and down. Right. All right. So, caramel sauce. That's what we're going to make next because you always have to have a sauce with uh, your souffle. A lot of times we'll do uh, a, a, like a little cream sauce or something like that, but I love caramel sauce. And even if you aren't ready to make a souffle, you can make this caramel sauce, put it over really good ice cream, crunch a bunch of those candy canes up and put that on top and call it good and it'll still be festive and fun. So when our director on our show, when she learned to make caramel sauce, all her friends thought she was a genius. So this is why I love to teach this recipe because it is so easy and it'll make you look like a genius. So let's see if we can get you to see the pan down here. Joni, tell me if we're at pan because now I can't see it. I think we're at pan. A little bit, oh, there you go. A little okay. bit further. There you go, perfect. Okay. All right, so sugar. And I have, I'm going to do a little less than a cup just because of the size of my pan, but I, this pan is a copper pan and conducts heat really, really well. So sugar in there very gently, try not to splash it all around. And then the water very gently. I give you a amount of water, but it really doesn't matter how much you just want the sugar moist, right? And the reason why it doesn't matter is that it'll just take longer for the sugar to brown if you add more water. So if you accidentally splash a little more water in there, then the recipe says don't sweat it. It's just going to take a little bit longer for this to come to a boil and then start to brown. This is super easy to do, but it's something you don't walk away from. And uh, John and I used to joke like if the kids are fighting or the phone's ringing, you just kind of let it go because the sugar will go from this where nothing is really happening to burning, billowing fire in what seems like a matter of seconds. I cannot tell you how many times I turn around, try to do too many different things in the kitchen <laughs> and all of a sudden my caramel is on fire. Um, which is why I keep the cream. So we're going to add heavy cream to this. So I keep it right next to the caramel so that it's there to add to the caramel right away so that it'll stop it from cooking. All right. So we're going to just let that cook for a few minutes. Then I have some good quality butter that I'm going to add to this. And then I have a really nice little sea salt that's going to be added to this. Um, we can do all kinds of things with this. Sometimes I add a little chocolate into this. So at the very end, you could just add a couple of ounces of uh, unsweetened because it's already sweet enough um, chocolate and just fold it in until it's nice and smooth. Sometimes I put a little instant espresso in here. That makes a great caramel also. And then if you really want to get fun, you can use cider instead of water to moisten the sugar and then you make a cider caramel sauce 
and you just wait for the exact same things that I'm going to tell you the little signs to wait for with the cider in it. And it's super, super delicious. I've also done it with red wine. It's a little harder to tell when it starts to turn brown, but that's also really delicious over a chocolate anything. All right, so we're starting to get boil. A lot of pastry chefs will, and I'm not a pastry chef, I just love to make desserts. A lot of pastry chefs will do this process dry and not add water. But what happens is when it's dry, a little bit over here will start to melt, a little bit over here will start to brown. This is still all dry. And it's just, it's too nerve wracking to try to get it all together and cohesive and not have it crystallize. So by moistening it, that allows the sugar to melt. Then the sugar will start to boil. And then as we lose moisture, it will start to brown once it gets to a certain point, a certain heat. Also, pastry chefs and I was classically taught to take a pastry brush and wet it and wipe down the sides of the pan. Nobody wants to or has time to do that. So if you just, once you start to cook this and put the water in it, you don't touch it until it turns brown. You don't stir it, you don't move it, you don't touch it. It's just like me, I'm talking about it, but I'm not touching it. And then if you do that, you won't have any problem with it crystallizing. And it's a lot faster, a lot less to deal with. The other thing that it'll start to do is once you cannot see a single part of the top of this sugar that doesn't have bubbles, is it completely boiling? That's when it's kind of a sign to pay attention. So I still have a few holes here, here, here that aren't all bubbly. But because this is such a great copper pan, it will not take very long. And then once we see color, then we can touch this. So you have to be very patient and not, not touch. You have to take just the tiniest little peek. Oh, they look good. <laughs> I just and Capri, Capri while, you're, while we're waiting for that to um, go to yeah. its perfect place, um, should the cream be cold or room temperature? Room that you're going to put in there. Warm. Okay. The colder it is, the more this is going to really bubble. So if it's warmer, if it's closer to the temperature of the caramel, you'll have a less volcanic reaction to it. Perfect. Yeah. And so then you can just pop it in the microwave for 30 seconds or something. Perfect. And then the the burner looks pretty hot. Do you have that all, all the way, the way on? on? As okay. high as you can go. Yeah. Great. Yeah. Great. Great. We want this process to go pretty fast. Mm -hmm. So crank it up. Crank it up, okay. <laughs> just love to crank it and up. How long, I mean, like, what's the normal amount of time that it takes? It is, it's like- About 10 minutes. minutes. Oh, 10 minutes, yeah. okay. Yeah. Longer With than I expected. Then it'll be about 10 minutes. And you okay. can make this today and it'll be fine at Christmas. Like it lasts forever, but it, you can make it days ahead of time. You can freeze, it, does, it just will behave so nicely. It's such a great sauce. And I always think, you know, there's, if you have a bad day, which we're kind of all having bad days right now, you all can just keep a all having bad of days. A spoonful of caramel makes the COVID go away, or at least for a moment. <laughs> I couldn't agree more. And eat dessert first. Life is I know. Right? I'm like, you know, I think I have the COVID-19, which is the poundage you put on during all of this. I have to say that I've eaten more chocolate during the last uh, nine months than I've ever have. So I have a cookie every single day, which I'm not, I'm not Perfect. normally like that. <laughs> <laughs> you know what? We need dessert right now. There's no we question. Do. <laughs> little sugar goes a long ways. <laughs> All right. I have a tiny little bit of brown, so I'm going to take the camera okay. down so you can see what I'm talking about. Joni, tell me when I'm there. Keep going, keep going, there you go. All right, Perfect. so there's just the smallest bit of brown right here. And as soon as we have that, that means I can swirl it. And it's best not to put a spoon or anything in here because then you're just gonna pull out a spoon with all this clump of sugar on it. So literally just give it a swirl to even out the color. And we want a nice, rich caramel color because all the flavor is in that caramel color. So if we go too light, then it's just gonna be a little weenie-ish and not, not super delicious and rich. 
So I'm just waiting for that perfect. This is why when it turned brown, it turned brown real fast. And if you aren't paying attention, that really, <laughs> really can. I've thrown a lot of pans away because of that. All right, so I'm just about perfect. At this point, it is time to turn it down a little bit low and you add just a little bit of the cream, a little bit of the cream. If you can see how, how it bubbles up, if you were to dump all the cream in there right away, then you would have a huge mess. But look at that delicious caramel. You also do not want to touch this because it is extremely hot. All right, so what happens is once you put that cream in there, it starts to, it sort of solidifies the sugar and you've got to give it a couple of minutes to break down so that you have a liquid, a sauce again. So that's why we want it on low that, and we don't want to create some kind of caramel volcano that goes bananas all over your stove. Usually what I suggest, I picked this pan because it's flat and wide and very shallow, and I thought it would be easier for people to see. But when you make it at home, pick a, a higher pan and a bigger pan than you think you're going to need. That gives you protection from anything bubbling like crazy. So I have a nice a big fat tablespoon of unsalted good butter. And this is actually a butter that's um, made in Parma, Italy. So it's delicious and amazing. And look at the, the sauce there, it's beautiful gold. Little pinch of that nice sea salt from France. And then I see I haven't put a spoon in I haven't put anything in that until basically it's done. You just kind of swirl the butter in. And now we have this gorgeous caramel sauce. It will solidify in the refrigerator, of course, because you've got butter and cream and the sugar, but all you have to do is just gently warm it up in a saucepan or you can microwave it gently. Either is totally fine. All right, so now I'm gonna scoot this back a little bit. I have a nice container. Make sure you can see that a little bit. So I have this beautiful container. So a very long time ago in my career, I worked at a restaurant that I ended up being the chef at called Fuller's here in Seattle. It was a fine dining restaurant. And that's where I made a lot of souffles. That was a big deal. It was the 80s, I made a lot of souffles for people. But we made those with pastry cream. And so they were a little bit more elaborate. But these are gonna be just as good and way, way simpler for someone at home to do. All right, I have my sauce. Taking a peek. Oh, they look so pretty. <laughs> we're gonna go back over here. So we're gonna go back to my island. I'll take my caramel sauce. So we have a few minutes, Joni, before the souffles come out. Does anybody have questions that I can answer? have quite a few so okay. um, first of all um if you're using the cider wine or chocolate how much do you normally add this exact same amount in the recipe so i think i say a third of a cup but you could use between a third and a half a cup okay and then when making savory souffles do you have any tips for us um savory souffles you usually would do um like a savory pastry cream so, or a Mornay sauce, something like that. So a Mornay sauce is basically a milk sauce that's thickened with a roux and then cheese is added. You could absolutely use that and then whip egg whites into it. Um, and tons of herbs, just don't make it too heavy. Souffles, if they're really, really heavy, if you make them too cheesy or too, too anything, they're gonna kind of not rise for you. And the other thing is you can 
put less cheese in the souffle and then make a cheese sauce that goes over it to make sure you get enough, you know, we got, we got to have more cheese. Um, that just sounds delicious. <laughs> <laughs> and then um, Wendy was wondering if there's any advantage to using a steam oven for the souffles. Oh, a steam oven would be amazing if you have one. Yeah, that's what we used to use at Fuller's. We had a convection steam oven that just, ooh, those made beautiful souffles. And would that be the same temperature as a regular convection yeah. oven? Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, okay. they, souffle is like hot heat because you're getting that lift from all that heat and that loves, it loves that heat. Don't want to cook and them at 200. <laughs> okay, and then um, what about a, a bain? A bainery. What is the, I don't know. Bainery is in a water bath. <laughs> so basically okay. bainery is what you would cook custard in. So you would take the container that I have but we would have filled it up about halfway up with warm water. You could do that. I don't think it would hurt. I kind of feel like it's a little more trouble than you need to take to get okay. some hot water in and mess with that. I'd rather just get the souffles in a nice hot oven and let them do their thing. What's your favorite way of cooking the souffles? Is it just the convection oven hot or regular convection. oven? Convection. Convection. Okay. Hot convection oven. Yep. Awesome. I mean, That's your connection. So many, over the years, John and I have taught so many cooking classes where people are like, I've had a convection oven for five years and I've never turned it on. And I'm like, oh my God, it makes the best potatoes. It'll make the best chicken you've ever roasted. You know, there are certain times when I don't, I don't like it with cake. I don't like it with custard. Anything that needs to be gently cooked, it's not mm -hmm. great for, but it is so good for so many things, roasting vegetables, things like that. Your turkey. You're making me hungry. I haven't <laughs> eaten yet. <laughs> I don't know. Has anybody else had dinner? I'm starving. I haven't had um, dinner either, but your kitchen doesn't smell like chocolate and peppermint and caramel <laughs> right now. Well, we were talking earlier, Capriola, about what are you going to have for um, Christmas Eve or Christmas night? Like, what does the chef cook? Yeah, so John and I talked about because it's just our daughter's in Brooklyn, and of course, she can't come home. And my parents are older and they're in Portland, so we can't see them. So it's John and our son, Alex and I, and we're, we all love crabs. So we're gonna do crab cakes for Christmas Eve. We're probably gonna wanna throw up by the time we're done with everything. <laughs> and then we're gonna do a rack of lamb on Christmas. And John's gonna make some pate for Christmas day also. And then I do these things that are a tradition in our family. They're called donut muffins. And I what make, is that? they're like a simple, like a, just a little simple sour cream muffin, but you roll them in melted butter and then you roll them in cinnamon sugar. And it's not- I'm gonna, be, I'm gonna come right up. I'm gonna be knocking on your door on <laughs> these we, special- This is how we open our presents. So I wanted to try and send some to my daughter, but I just figured they'd be mush by the time they got to Brooklyn. <laughs> well, well, going back to our conversation earlier, you know, even though the evening will be smaller, I mean, it's it's just even more time to celebrate and be grateful for the moments that we have together. Yep. And, um, you know, maybe spend a little bit more money on that bottle of wine that you're going to yeah, have. Yeah, that's what I said. I mean, we're going to drink yeah. really nice wine and we're going to, it's only going to be the three of us, but we'll Zoom with Savannah and my parents and we'll, we're talking about doing a little drive-by with our friends while we do a little, little, we walk, we have some friends that we can walk to, we can do a little toast with them. So, you know, you do, you have to be creative this Christmas, but hopefully yep. this is the last Christmas we have to do this. So yes. we just, if we all do what we should, we'll all get through this together and there won't be more people that are sick. Yes, absolutely. And yeah. tell them, just share for a moment what your friends are doing um, with the home <laughs> delivery. It's such a sweet, yeah, we, we Sweet have the best do. friends. We have, um, there's five couples um, that all hang out together and we've all known each other for about 40 years. Like we were there when we got married and had babies and all that. And she sent, my friend Diana sent an email last night saying her and Tom miss us all so much. They're dropping fried chicken dinner off at each of the couple's houses next weekend. I just love that. I mean, this time is even, I mean, even though this time is about giving, people are being so creative and so generous 
Yeah. And that is just such a lovely thing to do. It's like, yes, I miss you, but here's, you know, here's dinner and you know, maybe we could Zoom or do the house party thing, yeah. you know, for the younger kids, you know, it's just, it, it is a different, it's a time to reimagine how we've done things in the past. And, I agree. I agree. And, and, and yes, to be creative. Slow down a little bit. It's okay if we have one Christmas that's just a little calmer, <laughs> a yeah. little quieter. You it know? has been a little calmer, I would have to yeah. say. Yeah. Okay, I just, so I just want my parents to be here next Christmas and, and my friends to be here next Christmas, and that's what I keep reminding myself about. Yes. All right. I yes, know absolutely. Place. Let's vision so that. I'm going to go grab the souffle. Hang okay. On. Terrific. Okay, and everybody's asking while you're doing that, everyone's asking about the donut recipe. Would you be willing to share <laughs> that, Capriel? <laughs> Or is it in one of your cookbooks? Um, no, it's just uh, it's it's just something I saw once and then I started making it. All right, hold on here. Okay, here we go. Oh my gosh, look at those! So what I normally do now, you have to be ready. Like people can't, you know, your few people that are at your house cannot be up and about. You got to have them seated. I do a little, since it's Christmas, I do a little snow on top. And then hang on one sec. What I like to do is go to each person. Let's go here. Can you see that one? And I put the spoon in. You can in, definitely see that. And then you pour the caramel sauce in the center and then around the top. Just like that. Ooh, and I can hear it sizzling. <laughs> you can't hear the sizzle. Oh my I gosh, can. that looks so good. Here, we'll, we'll show you a, it's so hot, but ooh, look at that. Look at that. Mmm, so wow. pudding and fluffy. I can smell a little bit of peppermint on it. It's delicious. Smells delicious. It's too hot for me to take a bite of. <laughs> that looks just absolutely fabulous. I wish we were all there in your kitchen. I wish you were too. <laughs> I wish I was teaching a real cooking class where you guys got to all taste a little bit of this. Well, I have to say that everyone's so grateful to have an easy way to make souffle. I mean, you know, I've been intimidated by that for years, and <laughs> now I feel like I can even do this. So thank you, you so much. For do that. It. The one thing oh. I would tell you, since it's so mm -hmm. simple, practice one time before Christmas. Just make Perfect. it for the heck of it, and then you'll feel so much better. Once you, if you always feel better the second time you make something. Yeah, I know. It's just, and we have. Let's see, we have. 11 days before Christmas. So, or if you want to make it for Hanukkah or sure. whatever holiday yeah. you celebrate, I mean, you have, you have some time you can eat. I mean, look at how much Capriol did in just 45 minutes. So it's just having the right, right ingredients. You did mention a certain type of butter. What type of butter was that? So I get this butter from Parma, which is in Italy. And it's the same milk they use to make Parmesan cheese. And it's, Expensive butter, but for di for certain things like this caramel sauce, mm -hmm. I save that butter for those things, and then I use you know good decent butter for other stuff. But I like a, I like a special butter for my caramel sauce because it just makes it so much better. And Capriol, where do you get that? Do you buy that online? I get it or? at PCC here, but I think you can get it at Whole Foods or like um. Central Market here in Seattle, any kind of higher end grocery store, New Seasons in Portland probably carries it. Um, or Provador, which is in Portland, it's a great uh, specialty grocery store. They would have it for sure. Perfect. Yeah. And then you mentioned a favorite type of salt, and there are so many delicious salts out there. Yeah. I just have to ask you because I'm a, I, I'm a self proclaimed you know, chocoholic and saltaholic. <laughs> so where do you get the best salt and what do you recommend? Well, I buy it from anywhere I see salt, I buy salt. And I have over here, I have truffle salt right now. I have a smoked salt. I have a Malden salt. I have a fleur de sel. Yum. It's a different texture of kosher salt because they're all good for different things. Like 
the truffle salt is so good in mashed potatoes or on just roasted vegetables. It's delicious. Um, so you, you got to have a bunch of salt. <laughs> <laughs> yes, well, I agree. I could not agree more. You're talking to the right And a person. little bit of sea salt, flaky sea salt on top of this, on chocolate, it's so good. Delicious. So, so does, delicious. Does anybody else have any other questions? This has been such a fun evening. And Capriel, I'm going to make this and wow, my, my um, at least my yeah, partner on the holiday. You <laughs> so. know, even if they don't come out perfect, just slather it in caramel sauce and it'll still be really good. And you know, I just had a thought. It's like, I'll make some and then I'm going to share those with some of my neighbors. So yeah. that would be a that good be good way to spend the holiday. Yeah. So. Yeah. Well, thank you. I saw somebody ask about a large dish. With this souffle, you can't oh, okay. go too large. So you could do, I don't know if that's, if it's two quarts, whatever the smaller souffle dish is, if you want to make a larger one, don't go the big one that's like probably three quarts. Go go the smallest size you can get. So would, that would be what about the eight inch or smaller? Like Probably six? about eight inch. Okay. Yeah, I wouldn't do much bigger than that. It's just the chocolate is so heavy with a bigger souffle pan. It's just so, so hard to, okay. to get right. And then someone asked about how do you know when it's exact? Like, what is, when do you take it out? When do you know when it's exactly done and that it won't collapse? Yeah, they'll always collapse. They'll so always they, collapse. They always, Good to know. that's why you get them right to the table. They take about, you know, it's about two minutes. They've already, these have already started. They're pretty much collapsing now. You want the center to be nice and soft. Um, so usually I say about 20 to 25 minutes is about what you're looking for. And then you'll see the top has a nice crust on it. Look at this, I'll pull it down here. Oh, that looks so good. So these have a nice crust on them. So you can start to see the crust on these. They, um, they're not, there's, they're not super wet on the top. It's kind of hard to explain, but they, um, and you could gently, gently, if there's a crack, stick it with a knife and see if it comes out with moist crumbs too. But you want to be gentle because you could deflate them. Okay. And you, yeah, I mean, but there's some of them are going to fall anyway, right? They're always going to fall. They're always no going to fall. Yeah. Okay. And then, so Nature somebody the asked, day. for someone who is, needs to be dairy free, do you have a good dairy free alternative that you would recommend? You know, if you're going to, I haven't tried it, but my favorite dairy free thing to use is oat milk because it has the nice viscosity and it's mm -hmm. not going to take away from the chocolate. Um, so I, I have a feeling that oat milk would work pretty well on me, but I have not tried it personally. That would just be my, I would say experiment with it once. Yeah, and there is a really good butter out there by, it's called, I think it's Mykonos it is, and it's a dairy-free alternative oh, nice. butter nice. that I have found to be excellent when I yeah. decide to use. I don't always use dairy-free, but when I do, I use that one. Yeah, and the Oatly, which is the best oat milk out there, the rest of them taste like brown chalk, but <laughs> the Oatly's got nice, nice texture to it and good flavor. Well, Capriel, this has been so fun as usual. And how can people support you during this time? Come down to Madison Kitchen and- If you feel comfortable coming in, by all means, come and get something to go. You can um, also order online, which is so nice and pay online. And so you're in and out in two seconds. You don't have to scan in line. You don't have to be next to anybody. You literally come in and pick it up and take it home. So we've tried to make that easy for people that shouldn't be out too much or for all of us that shouldn't be out too much. Uh, so come see us. And if you're somebody who needs to stay home until this is over, come see us when it's over. Yep. Well, I'll be down very soon. Well, thank you all yeah. so much. And Capriel, it's just such a joy. Happy holidays to you. you. <laughs> somebody, you're getting a big clap. Thank um, you, everybody. Well, yeah, thank you for joining us and um, check out Rebel 11 for upcoming events. I'll be hosting a solstice celebration this coming Saturday and bring your diary. Um, we'll be doing some reflection and visioning for the new year. In the meantime, have a wonderful- Good visioning. <laughs> little visioning. Um, have a great week and um, thank you again for joining us. It's just a delight. Have a great holiday, everyone. Happy holidays, everyone. <laughs>